Okay, thanks everyone for coming here today to this event that's been hosted here in UL by the Department of Journalism, that's Fergal, and by the School of Modern Languages and Applied Linguistics, that's me, um, in conjunction with Dublin-based NGO Frontline Defenders. And we're very pleased um, and honoured really to have the opportunity to host this event. Asim Trivedi is a political cartoonist and political cartoons have had a very complex relationship with official them for centuries. At times they've been allowed to just slip under the radar. They've been dismissed as maybe a trivial or a lower art form. Um, in my own research in Latin America, I've seen how under authoritarian regimes they can be allowed as a form of controlled protest and as a favorable alternative to open revolution. But that's not always the case. Um, sometimes they're not tolerated by governments and they cause anger and they provoke outrage as is the case in India, where Asim Trivedi has endured periods of imprisonment, or a period of imprisonment for his work. Um, political cartoons involve art, but they're not art, they're more than that. They've been called a type of visual news discourse, and also maybe a compressed commentary on social events. And as such, they serve a very important function. They tell us all that's wrong in our society, like injustice, like intolerance like the abuse of power by those who have it, corruption and human rights violations, as we'll hear about today from a scene. Okay, just one last thing. The format of today's talk is going to be 45 minutes. It's going to be a Q&A. Fergal and I will, maybe for 30 minutes, will just lead and prompt a scene to tell us about his background, his career and his activism. And then for the final 15 minutes, we'll take some questions from the floor. Okay, so now we'll hand you over to Tara Madden, who will tell us about Frontline Defenders and also introduce us to a scene. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So thank you very much for having us. Um, I work with Frontline Defenders. So Frontline Defenders is an international human rights organization based in Dublin. It was founded by an Irish woman in 2001. And we focus all our energies on providing practical assistance for the protection of human rights defenders at risk. So human rights defenders are people who advance and protect human rights peacefully, and we see them as the most effective for advancing and protecting human rights because they work at the local and national levels. They have the biggest impact on their communities, and it's because they're so effective that they are at risk. So a human rights defender could be a community leader, a women's rights activist, an environmentalist, a trade unionist, a lawyer, a journalist, and anyone who is defending the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And they put themselves at risk to defend the rights of others. So Frontline Defenders um, provides practical assistance. So we have an emergency hotline in five languages that if anything happens to a human rights defender, they can ring up at any time of the day or night. We provide security grants. So it could be to, to secure the office with a CCTV camera or bars on the windows or locks, alarm system, etc. Or if the human rights defender's life is in immediate danger, we can pay for a temporary relocation. And we do training in personal security, so physical security or security of your organisation, how to have a security plan if something happens, and then online security as well, so keeping your computer safe, keeping your data safe, your email communication, your social media accounts safe. And then we focus a lot of attention then on advocacy and, and campaigning at the international level, challenging and, and demanding that governments protect their own citizens, protect the human rights defenders in their countries, and also at the EU and the, and the UN. And campaigning is a big part uh, of our work now because we try to counteract the defamation against human rights defenders. So they're accused of being traitors or terrorists or foreign spies. And we're trying to build their recognition, both in their own countries and internationally, so that they're recognized as being effective. And we're trying to create more space for their protection so that they can carry out their legitimate activities. So we're delighted to have Asim Trivedi here with us. He's been on a whirlwind tour. He was in London, Glasgow and Edinburgh. He was in Dublin at the Book Festival. And he is a human rights defender and cartoonist from India. So he played a leading role in the anti-corruption movement in 2010 in India with his cartoons against corruption. He was arrested because of it. 
Uh, he was charged with sedition and of insulting national symbols. And most recently, and what makes it very interesting for us, so not only is he a human rights defender raising human rights issues in his own country, he's now, since last year, started telling the stories of human rights defenders in other countries uh, with, with very... Um, with, with visuals that are, that are really effective. So uh, that makes it interesting for us, and he's going to talk a bit about that later as well. So I'll hand over to the panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see. Welcome to you, El. Thank um, you, thank you. My first question for you is about your background. Can you just tell us maybe how you got into cartooning, and when and why did you start? Uh, I started just after my schools in 2004. When my age was like 17. 17 years old. Yeah, I started drawing cartoons, and um, because me and my friends, we were trying to start a, um, some kind of weekly magazine, but we were not that uh, you know uh, at that age we were not that powerful, and okay. then we realized that we could not do it. Okay. But uh, during the research and all, we uh, we gone through many libraries and bookstores, and I found a book. Uh, it was like uh, how to draw cartoons, and I started okay. drawing it, and. Uh, Maybe the medium suits me, and uh, I got a uh, daily column in newspaper, and the thing started. Okay, and were your cartoons always political? Do they always have maybe political and a social focus? It they were political at the time, like the like the cartoons you see in the newspapers, the editorial cartoons, just the reactions of the things that are happening okay. around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, I just have a question for you about freedom of speech in India. Um, that. You know that the constitution of India ha seems to have a pretty strong defence of it. Just to ask your opinion on that, and just to see how the defence of it, maybe in the constitution, is reflected in the reality on the ground. Uh, actually, our constitution, I think, uh, kind of guarantees freedom of expression. There is Article 19, which says that you are able to express your views mm -hmm. um, in any way you want. Uh, but actually, when we see the reality, it doesn't happen because. Uh, India is a place where religions are quite strong and people are divided into different communities and they get hurt easily and uh, they are quite sensitive and sentimental about their, you know, about their symbols, about their religion, about their community mm -hmm. and also the politics plays an important role okay. because uh, when you have your population divided in certain communities you must have the political representations from that society and to be, uh, you know, to be a political leader of certain community, they try to, you know, raise issues, they are not actually there, and they try to sometimes harass people, writers, activists. Okay, you know. I think Fergal will develop that a bit more with you. Mm -hmm. But my last question for you for now is maybe to tell us more about the Cartoons Against Corruption site, how it came about. Maybe can you tell us a little bit about its content and its context? Uh, because when I used to draw cartoons for newspapers, I always used to think that um, the cartoons could be used for a better purpose. For a, for a meaningful aim of themselves. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe I, I was always, you know, trying to find a way to use my cartoons beyond the newspapers. Okay. Because when you draw cartoons for newspapers, they die in a day or two and a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted them to last long mm -hmm. and to serve a purpose which could be better than, you know, uh, make your readers smile. So, okay. uh, and there was a big movement in India called India Against Corruption in 2011. It was a huge movement, a messy movement. A lot of people from different parts of the country, like the big activists, many journalists, many writers, authors, and a lot of people joined this movement. And not only certain people, but even uh, the common man was supporting it quite vigorously. And uh, we used to have protests and march and kind of uh, okay. demonstrations in you know, in even the rural parts of the country as well. Okay. So it was a big moment and we were demanding a law for, you know, a, a strong anti-corruption law. We okay. used to call it Lokpal Bill, which could never be passed. So this particular moment gave me a reason to use my cartoons for a purpose. Okay. And I started a website called cartoonsagainstcorruption.com and, um, you know, started posting my anti-corruption cartoons there. Okay. So the, the so I was just going to talk about... Uh, uh, with you, Asim, just about uh, what these cartoons on behalf of cartoons uh, against corruption, what, what it led to, I suppose. Um, and uh, uh, just before we go into that, and uh, to revisit probably what was a, a difficult uh, period, but just to give the, uh, the people here some context, um, I just wanted to show a news report 
um, from and it, it, it seemed it was, this was in 2011. 2012. When I was arrested. 2012, uh, yes. where Asim was arrested. So we we just have a, a short um, news clip, which uh, just a reminder. I'm not sure whether you've seen this one already, Asim. Maybe, but. Uh, this is from uh, N N N D T V, and this this it's, it's a good news channel there. Okay. For base political cartoonist Asim Trivedi was arrested and sent to police custody by a Mumbai court. Charges against him posting uh, seditious content on his website. The police had arrested him on Sunday on the basis of a complaint filed in December last year. But Mr. Trivedi's supporters say the political arrest for work backing Anna Hazare and his India against corruption. Defending his actions even after being arrested by the Mumbai police. Kanpur based political cartoonist Asim Trivedi, a member of Arvind K. Jrivas, India Against Corruption, put up allegedly offensive cartoons at Anna's rally in Mumbai last year. The cartoons mocked the Indian parliament. He has also been charged with putting up obscene content on his web portal. India Against Corruption alleged political vendetta. Misrepresenting the national emblem is concerned. I think there he has gone a little bit too far, which is beyond the limits. National emblem or national flag, only the celebrities are pardoned under that situation. Here, Mr. Asim is, uh, seems to be an unknown figure. I wish the government shows similar reaction when any celebrities do such blunders. The police say they are acting on the court's orders. The court issued a non available arrest warrant against the cartoonist after a lawyer's complaint against Trivedi's satire. In Mumbai, Rashmi Rajput for NDTV. India's number one news app. Okay, so um, uh, if you could just expand on that uh, a little bit. So the, the charge against you was uh, sedition. Mm -hmm. um, Asim, what, what does that charge involve? Uh, actually, there were three charges against me. Mm -hmm. uh, one was them, and the most serious one was sedition. And uh, uh, the other one was um, a section from our IT Act. It, it was called like Section 66A of IT Act. And the third one was uh, about insulting national symbols. Um, it used to be called like uh, prevention to insult to national emblem at 1972. So there were three charges. Sedition used to have a uh, provision of life imprisonment. And uh, the other two charges used to have uh, a provision of imprisonment of three years. Okay. Um, and were they on the basis of a specific cartoon or se several cartoons or just the, the, the website in general? Or w was there a particular cartoon that was problematic? Uh, actually, uh, the cartoons they mentioned, there were eight or nine cartoons they were very unhappy with. So in those cartoons, I can say there was a cartoon where I tried to redraw my national emblem. Because in my cartoons, uh, um, in cartoonsagainstcorruption.com, I published a couple of series. So one of the series was uh, like uh, New National Symbols of India, where I tried to reimagine the national symbols, you know. So uh, I tried to redraw my national symbol and national emblem. And uh, in our national emblem, we have three lines. So I replaced them with the wolves, and this was my new national emblem. And uh, this was a cartoon, I think, that, that they found quite... Uh, uh, insulting to, to the nation itself, and another cartoon was there. So it, it replaced uh, lions with with wolves. With wolves, yes. Okay. And in another cartoon, I drew my parliament as a toilet. Okay. It was because we were demanding a strong anti-corruption bill, and I think uh, it should be there because parliament should be very happy to pass such a anti such a strong anti-corruption bill in the country. Uh, there were a lot of scams and a lot of problems with uh, you know, governance due to corruption. So, but they were not doing so. So, uh, and we were really extremely unhappy with the uh, with our representatives. So, it is why I drew my parliament in this in this way. And because there was a lot, also a reason that elections in India are mostly based on the caste politics and sometimes the communal politics, and they ignore the actual issues like unemployment, like the poverty, and like the development. So. Uh, this is why I drew my parliament in this way. So I think these two cartoons were uh, 
Well, one of the, well, some of the cartoons they were not happy with. So this uh, cartoon uh, representing Parliament as a, t- uh, as a toilet, um, and again, sedition, the, the definition is, is conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of the state or, or, or monarch. Um, so th- th- that was regarded as oh, you're, you're inciting a rebellion of some sort. <laughs> not at all, because uh, sedition means to initiate or to, or to attempt to initiate a war against the nation. So trying a cartoon is not like a war against the nation. Trying a cartoons, and especially when they are anti-corruption, you are trying to improve your nation. You are trying to criticize some policies, some of the things that are happening there. And it's not about, uh, it's not at all about, you know, the waging a war against the nation or something. So uh, actually, it was not me who, who has gone too far. It was, the, uh, it was the policemen, I think, and the people who charged me. They have gone too far in applying the charges. <laughs> and when did you uh, first realize that you, were, that, 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 you, that you were in trouble or you were... Uh, was it just a, a knock on your door early in the morning? Did, did you see this coming? Did you, uh, did you have uh, any sense that...? I was not very uh, well aware that uh, it could happen because uh, uh, actually they banned my website at first. So they banned uh, the they website? They banned my website in December 2011. Mm-hmm. So um, after that I came into contact with some cyber activists and I learned about some laws. They were there in our constitution. And they were widely used to uh, suppress the freedom of expression like uh, uh, they had enabled the government to block and remove any content they are not happy with from the social media. And there were some other laws, uh, you know, who were enabling them to arrest people even for their Facebook and social media posts. So we started a campaign against these particular laws. And then in September 2012, um, e- even the end of the August 2012, I got to know about the cases, about the case where, and the three charges, and okay. the police reached my house with the non-available warrant, and then I had to surrender to the police. So, so you had to surrender to the police. <laughs> and then you were, uh, you were actually, Imprisoned for a period was this? Uh, d- 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 can you, can can you tell me about that? Uh, actually, um, there were the charges like sedition. So um, and also, I decided not to hire a lawyer and not to apply for a bail until they removed the charges of sedition. So Why? it was my demand because it was quite ridiculous to prove yourself. You know that you are not a traitor. That's why you got to also. And it's quite ridiculous to prove you are a patriot in the court because I believe like. Um, India is not a piece of land. India is actually the people, they live there. And if I live there, so I'm a part of India. So how can I be anti-Indian? There's no possibility of me being anti-Indian. So I don't even believe in the idea of sedition in a democracy, actually. Mm. So uh, it was quite uh, surprising to, for me to be, uh, be tried for, in the charges of sedition. So I decided not to hire a lawyer, not to apply for a bill. Mm-hmm. And, um, it worked for me, for me, I think, because a lot of people uh, came in my support after that, mm. and I received a, a huge, huge support. And uh, because when they arrested me, I was arrested on 8th of September. Next day, they produced me in the court and demanded a police custody for a week. They demanded uh, police custody for a week, and uh, court granted it because I didn't have any law or anything. So, and then, but the very next day, they had to reproduce me before court to surrender the police to custody. Mm-hmm. Because there was a huge criticism in social media, huge criticism to, uh, you know, by a lot of activists, a lot of artists, uh, and even the many politicians who used to be in the opposition at that particular time. So they had to uh, surrender the police custody, and, the, uh, and because I still had no lawyer with me, so court sent me to, to the judicial custody uh, in the jail for two weeks. And uh, in three or four days, like on 11th September, there was a PIL filed by an any advo- any independent advocate in the high court, um, and they de- and he de- demanded my freedom, the bail for me, and court ordered the bail. So 12 September I was released from the jail. Okay. Yes. So tell me about that time uh, so that, that that you spent in prison. I mean, what what were conditions like? Did you worry that this was going to be uh, like you would have had no mm-hmm. idea how long this might <laughs> actually? Go on uh, th- that was the most horrible part for me because some of my friends who used to be lawyer. They told me that uh, if you are demanding that at first you should uh, remove the sedition charges only, then you will ask for bail. So they told me that uh, it might take you know a, a time like six months or something. So you 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 should be prepare you should prepare yourself for uh, for a period of six months to be in prison. But it happened too fast, so I think I was quite lucky, and uh, it was a huge campaign because at first the charges of sedition and then only for the cartoons and and. 
And one reason was that because at that particular time, the mood of the country was quite different. Everybody was quite charged against the government mm -hmm. uh, because of the corruption. And the movement was getting a massive support. So a lot of people came in my support and things happened too quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had to release me. And within a month, like uh, on 12th October 2012, the same year, in, within a month, they removed the charges of sedition from my case. Mm -hmm. They sought for an opinion. Uh, from Advocate General of the state, and uh, he advised to remove the charges. So then I had only two charges in my case, like uh, a section from IT Act and the uh, charge related to the insert of national symbols. And then in 2015, Supreme Court scrapped that particular section of IT Act. It is not even in our constitution. So uh, and I'm facing only one charge, and I'm still waiting for the summons. <laughs> okay, so it's it's so elements of this are are still ongoing, and yes. um, so you you were in prison. Were you surprised when you were released then? Uh, the, the yeah, I was uh, surprised to get uh, to receive that uh, kind of support because uh, when I was locked up, in, I was in lockup, so uh, uh, newspapers are not allowed in the in the lockup, so I was not really aware of what has, what is happening in the outer world. But the, when they accepted me to the jail. So um, I could read the newspapers and I could understand what is happening there. Mm. And then I could realize that uh, maybe I would not have to stay here for a long time. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and this uh, campaign to have you released, who, who was behind that? Obviously, you couldn't uh, do, do much no, from your position. <laughs> no, at all. No internet uh, or anything? Or, uh... <laughs> at all. Actually, uh, uh, because at that time, the anti-corruption movement was quite active. Mm. So many leaders of the corruption, of, of the anti-corruption movement, many volunteers of that movement, and even because I was arrested in Mumbai, so it is a city of Bollywood, so a lot of film artists actually, they also I started speaking against my arrest, and uh, some very influential people who used to be in a position at that particular time, they also supported me. Mm -hmm. So I received a wonderful support, and one, my, one of my friends who used to be a part of a founder member of the movement I was running against the internet censorship. His name is Alok Dichit and he's not busy with, with some other campaign. So he was also kind of coordinating that, that campaign. Did you ever at any point think, this isn't what I, uh, I can't do this. You know, I'm a cartoonist. I, uh, I, I'm not ready to go to prison for my beliefs. Uh, did, was, there at, was there any point where you wished you could? Oh. It was really like, um, because I have never been in jail before, yeah. and uh, I was a cartoonist, not a crime reporter, so I had, uh, I didn't have, get a chance to interact with, you know, you know the police and the prisons and lockups, so it was quite surprising for me, and I can say that, yes, I was kind of afraid as well, but because, again, I say that it was a mood of the nation, that everybody was quite politically charged against the government, against the corruption, uh, because of the movement, because that was the time when we, op when we were observing the uprisings in many countries in the Middle East as, as well. Mm -hmm. So I think they, the, all of these things proved to be quite encouraging for me, mm -hmm. and I could dare <laughs> to do um, that all. But you, you felt you, did you feel you had support from uh, other cartoonists and other newspapers? Uh, uh, the, the, the guy in the report there, for example, uh, mentioned that he thought you had gone too far with this cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had strong support in certain sections. Did you feel uh, that journalism, uh, that, that the media in general, recognized that this was a freedom of speech issue that affected everybody? I think most of the media groups supported me. Mm -hmm. uh, even the Press Council of India, uh, their chairman also, you know, issued a statement in my support. So it, used, it, it, became, it, it proved to be very beneficial, I think, for my case, because Press Council of India was quite, uh, you know, they took a strong stance in my support, so it was very helpful. And then, um, and the media was also very helpful. Uh, but in certain, certain cases, I think the cartoonists, especially the cartoonists, were not that supportive. A lot of them were criticizing me, because I think they operate in a country where, you know, where self-censorship is quite dominant. So they had learned to censor themselves, and they don't have any practice of free mm -hmm. speech at all. So. They think they way in the same way. So they, they really thought that I might have gone so far. So this is what they, they were trying to speak. Uh, so I had some TV debates as well and some news channels where there were some cartoonists from, them, from some other newspapers and, and they were criticizing me on the news, on the news debates as well. But yes, the, there were some cartoonists as well who supported me. When, so, you, when you were released, what effect uh, did this experience have, have on your work? Did you become more critical 
or less critical after your release from prison? Did you roll back a little bit, or did it did it did it make you feel mm. that you could do cartoons about whatever you wanted? I think when I started this cartoons against corruption, uh, I was still more a cartoonist. I was actually a cartoonist, but uh, but after the ban on the, my website and after my arrest, mm. I ended up as an activist. I think mm. so. When I was released, I thought uh, I think that I was. Uh, more like an activist at the, at the moment, and uh, because afterwards I was more active with the ground campaigns than the cartooning, uh, so I think they made me cartoonist. Uh, they made me an activist out of a cartoonist. So uh, this whole process, you know. <laughs> and uh, in general, then, so you, you you'd regard yourself more of a, as an activist than a cartoonist at the moment. Um, what's the relationship between journalism? And uh, and political cartoons, do you think? Well, I think there's a strong uh, connection. Uh, cartooning is a way where you have some kind of creative freedom uh, to do your journalistic work, actually, because you can express and you can, uh, I mean, you can report the things uh, with the flavor of your opinion as well. So it gives you a kind of freedom. I think it is. Uh, one of the very few uh, kind of journalism they give you creative freedom, like photojournalism somehow gives you freedom to express and, and then cartooning as well. Cartooning, I think it is, a, it is, you know, it is quite rich with the freedom of being creative because you can add your opinion always, like, you know, in its editorial cartoons as well. So it is a part of journalism, but it could be, it can be used very strongly and sometimes people use it strongly. But sometimes they just make jokes about the things and yeah. uh, some cartoonists draw the cartoons with a purpose only to bring in a smile on the face of the yeah. reader. And then they, I think, miss the whole game. Yeah. Because cartoons are, more, um, cartoons are more effective when they disturb you, yeah. not, when they, not when they make you laugh. So yeah. I think this is where uh, the power of satire lies. And yeah. any kind of satire works in the same way, they disturb yeah. you. And then you need to, you know, you, you get to think about that, you, and then it kind of a brainstorming the initiates and in, initiate in your mind. And so, do you think there are any limits to what you can do as a cartoonist? Are, are there limits to freedom of, of of expression, in your opinion? And if so, where are they? I think there are no freedom, no limit. There should be no limit uh, in the freedom of expression because. Uh, uh, because there cannot be any limit on freedom, because they are quite opposite. When there is limit, there is no freedom. It's just like that. So both cannot exist in the same time. Mm. Like uh, if you have a prison, if you have a cage, so no matter how big it is, it is finally a cage. So I don't think they can exist exist on the same time or the same place. As well as I want to say that uh, freedom of speech starts at the moment your freedom ends. Like. Um, because in this world we don't practice a lot of freedom, because we live in a world which is not, you know, operating uh, with the ideas we agree. It has its own, its own, its own ideas. Like, like maybe I don't believe in money. Like maybe I don't believe in certain constitutions, or certain laws in my constitution. But I will have to obey them. Maybe I don't think that I need, I should need a visa to cross the countries. But, but. <laughs> But no matter what I think, I will have to get a visa if I need to cross the borders. So there's no freedom. But this is when you can write. Imagine there's no country. So I think there's a point when your freedom stops existing. Your freedom of speech takes over. And now you still can share your ideas. They are not even in practice anywhere. Uh, you cannot practice them. But when you see them, when you share them, again, the song, amazing, there's a line, I, I cannot you know, recall it completely, but there's a line, John Lennon says, like, uh, uh, I'm not the only one, and maybe you can join us. So this is freedom of speech. You just hear that this is not, this is just, this maybe I'm the only one who thinks way, but maybe you also think this way, and maybe you can join, and, and this is how the thoughts and how the ideologies get changed with the time. Okay. Um, is there anything you would be afraid to do a cartoon about in a, in an Indian context? And I'm, I suppose I, it, it calls to mind the Charlie Hebdo uh, the, 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 uh, incident last year, where uh, people died. Uh, cartoonists were were attacked for portraying uh, the, the, the 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 Prophet Muhammad in uh, in their cartoons. Is there subjects that you feel that you would be afraid to do a cartoon about in an Indian context? 
It's all about time because um, when you have to think, are you afraid or not? It means there is danger. And if there is a danger, so it depends, uh, you know, what kind of mood you are going through. So sometimes you are happy to take risk and sometimes you are not ready to take risk. So it's all about your psychology at that particular time. But I think, like, uh, I want to remember, I want to recall, uh, share a moment. In 2012 only, before my arrest, there was a controversy. They removed a cartoon of a politician, a very big leader, a big social reformer, who used to be a uh, big social reformer in India uh, during our freedom struggle, and he, was, he used to be the head of the committee who formed our constitution as well. So they removed a cartoon of this person from the textbooks because a uh, certain community was feeling that uh, the cartoon was insulting him. So this cartoon was removed from the textbook, so I posted a cartoon on my Facebook. They were like comparing uh, Prophet with this person. Like there are certain people who, used, uh, who should be spared from cartooning. So, uh, and then I posted it on my Facebook and people loved it so much. Some of them. Some of them were criticizing me very much and some of them, you know, uh, I also received kind of threats. So, uh, uh, though I think they were not that serious, but uh, uh, some of my friends suggested me that uh, it could be dangerous for me and maybe for my family, and I removed that cartoon. It was like April 2012. I was arrested in September 2012 for other cartoons. So, so I removed that particular cartoon. But um, in 2015, after Charlie had done attack, uh, a representative from an international media group, print media group, uh, she contacted me and she said that uh, if I want to draw something on this particular issue, Charlie had and because I was quite disturbed at the moment uh, by this attack, as I think uh, most of the cartoonists were, uh, I drew a cartoon and I again depicted Prophet. So, but in this, this cartoon, I tried to explain why it was so important to depict Prophet. Uh, it was a cartoon, it, it, it was actually a cartoon stripe of three panels of cartoons. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the cartoon, there were a cartoonist and there was a portrait of Prophet that he was drawing on the drawing board. Mm -hmm. So, is this one of the ones you have with you here today? Yeah, I think, I Can think I've, so. Shall I find it? Uh, I think so. Hmm. So in that particular cartoon, in the first uh, panel, the, the portrait of Prophet was asking the cartoonist, why are you are looking so afraid? Why are you looking so afraid, drawing me? So the cartoonist says, because uh, your followers may kill me for it. The Prophet asked, do you believe they are my followers? The cartoonist replies, they say they are. And then Prophet asks, so is it worth risking your life? And the cartoonist says, yes, because... I think this is the one. Yes, because if I don't do it, the guns will become the prophets. So that's why fear should not lead the thoughts. Fear should not control the society. Fear should not control the rights, the way we live. And it should be our intellect, it should be our conscience that should control us, not the fear. When fear, is, fear becomes dominant, I think um, everything gets changed. And fear should never be in the leading position. So uh, the people who are not drawing, drawing prophet now, are not drawing cartoons of prophet now, are actually not, they don't agree with the idea of sparing prophet from the cartoons, but they are afraid of asking their okay. So we are making fear dominant. And fear is leading the people, so it is dangerous. I think. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think that this was the, uh, this is my favorite cartoon <laughs> that okay. I could even draw. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. And uh, just to tell us about the change in the law. I'm kind of conscious of time um, a, a little bit, but the, the the law that was changed last year, then as a result of your activism. Uh, it was not only the result of my activism because a lot of people were protesting against it, mm -hmm. and um, uh, there was a PIL filed in the Supreme Court. And uh, I was also a co-petitioner there, though. So when the PIL was filed and the Supreme Court accepted the PIL, they said that uh, uh, they were expecting a PIL on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. So because everybody used to you know, get news of some new arrests, some new charges for the social media posts. And a lot of people uh, were being arrested those days. Because in 2012, in 2011, there was a big moment in India. and. Um, during this moment, I think people actually started using their social media very politically. And they became very vocal and they started criticizing the government and each and everything that is like. So uh, we used to have Article 19.1a in our constitution. So we, had, we used to have a right to express 
but we didn't have a medium. So social media, I think, gave us a medium. So and it was not uh, a very good thing for the governments because they don't want uh, dissent to be so to be so vocal, to be so general, okay. and. So, so the change in the law was... Yeah, change in the law was 2015 because a lot of people were criticizing this arrest and a lot of innocent people, even the innocent students, uh, you know, had, had been arrested under this, this law and had been tried. So Supreme Court finally in 2015, March 2015, scrapped this law and said that this is a law which goes against uh, the preamble of the Constitution, against freedom of speech, against the Article 19 body. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, that kind of leads on to my question then, really. I mean, what is your situation now? You're back living in India. What is your relationship with authority? Do you feel comfortable living there now? Yeah, I think because India is a very strong democracy. Mm. Uh, and uh, they, just, they just don't you know, torture you, harass you. And because media is very strong, so and uh, they will not spare government, they will not spare anyone. So I think that uh, situation in India is still very good. But somehow we are leading to a position where, you know, nationalism is kind of uh, leading the things, like, okay. like kind of ultra-nationalism, because we have a government there uh, who, is also fo who is always focusing on Pakistan and our nationalist things to divert the, mm -hmm. divert the people from the real issues, like the poverty, like the unemployment, and like mm -hmm. a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So they just want to talk about Pakistan all the time. Right. So, to, to be able to divert the people. And uh, now everybody who criticizes the government, the Prime Minister Modi, he is labeled as an international. Mm. And uh, so they are just trying to discourage the dissent, mm. discourage the people mm. who, who are, you know, who criticize the government. And I think it is the job of the journalism to criticize, to question, mm. to doubt. And they want to censor this whole process of questioning, censoring, questioning, criticizing, right. and doubting. Okay. So, Okay. Now, can you tell us... But, but still, I think I'm very safe. So, to, to, sure. This is okay. the answer to the question. I'm, I feel I'm safe, and Good. I think everybody there who is, you know, practicing his freedom of speech, unless he lives in some remote area, some, some, right. some area which okay. are quite accessible. Yeah. So I think the situation is good. Not bad. Okay, great. And can you tell us maybe about your current project, which is very interesting, Black and White, your online mm -hmm. um, cartoon magazine, really, for the defense of human rights. Can you tell us about who's involved in that, what it is exactly, what are the aims of it? Yeah, actually, Black and White uh, is an online cartoon magazine mm. uh, which aims to support human rights defenders, and especially the writers, bloggers, journalists, mm. who have been detained in their, in their past of work, yeah. uh, who are facing some charges, serious charges, or some, some you know, unfair trials, yeah. or some un inhuman sentences. Yeah. So I'm just trying to advocate them through my cartoons. Okay. It started with the case of Rai Badavi. Because just after Charlie had the incident, when I did this cartoon, mm. uh, 9 January 2015, mm. um, Rai Badavi uh, had to endure his first, first 50 lashes. Rai Badavi um, uh, is a blogger from Saudi Arabia uh, who has been sentenced with 1,000 lashes, 10 years in prison, and I think a fine of 1 million in their, in their currency. So uh, there was a big movement uh, in support of Rai Badavi after his first flogging, first episode of his flogging. And, uh, uh, he was flogged with 50 lashes in front of a lot of people uh, in a public place in Saudi Arabia. And the video got viral and a lot of people started protesting. And then when I you know, got uh, to learn about Rai Badavi, mm -hmm. I decided to draw 50 cartoons against those 50 lashes. Mm -hmm. So I started posting my cartoons and I, then I came in touch with uh, his wife, uh, who is in political asylum in Canada right now, and uh, campaigning for him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who were campaigning for him and uh, because 50 cartoons took a long time. So in between that time, a lot of people contacted me, like uh, Asma Darwis, she is a wife of uh, a human rights defender from Bahrain. Okay. So her wife, her husband, um, Hussain Amjad, used to, uh, had been detained in the Bahrain, so mm -hmm. she, she wrote me on Twitter to draw some cartoons for her husband okay. and some supporters of a Bahraini activist, uh, Nabil Rajab. Okay. Uh, they also emailed me, I think they were based in US. Uh, yes. UK, I'm not, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. And they, they, you know, they emailed me to that yeah. I should draw some cartoon support of Nabil Raja. Yeah. He was also detained there. Yeah. And then um, these requests that I was receiving, the kind of response I received after this mm. uh, Badavi cartoon series, mm. I decided that I could, I thought that I could do it in a long term way. Okay. And I started this online magazine where I published a series of cartoons for the okay. defenders, for the writers who are being targeted for their expressions. Mm. You know, we're living in very kind of strange, I could say crazy political times, not just in India, but everywhere. What do you think is the role of the political cartoonist in today's society? Do you think cartoonists have 
power to affect real social change? I think always when the, when the times are darker, mm -hmm. the role of the cartoons and even the quality of the cartoons become more powerful, become, they, they, you know, I think. Uh, because when I see the cartoons from Iran, like I have many cartoons, cartoonists in Iran, they are my favorite, including Manani Astani, who is actually my favorite cartoonist. So the Iranian cartoonists are, cartoons are more powerful, but we don't, we cannot draw those cartoons in India because the situation is are quite cool, mm. are quite nice. So when you are in time, they are more uncom uncomfortable, cartoons will be mightier, cartoons will be better, cartoons will be, you know. Mm. So, uh, and yes, I, I understand that this time, I think in this whole world, not even in India, not, mm. in, not, not only in Europe, not mm. only in the US, everywhere there's a time of mm. um, some kind of issues like mm. um, fascism, racism, I don't know, mm. because I hear this in every place. Mm. I used to hear it in India, mm. and then I'm hearing it uh, you know, in Europe also, so I think we are in dark time, and in mm. dark times, cartoons becomes more important and uh, more powerful as well. And because we are observing a lot of attacks on the cartoonists, mm -hmm. a lot of people are facing charges, like not only Charlie Hebdo attack, um, a lot of Iranian cartoonists are on political asylum, living mm -hmm. in different countries like France, Kuwait, and of them. And um, Athena Fagodani is a cartoonist. She, was, she had been arrested a couple of times in the last two years for her cartoons. There's a cartoonist uh, in Malaysia, Junar. Junar is facing sedition charges mm -hmm. and imprison imprisonment of 43 years. Uh, a cartoonist from uh, South Africa, Zapiro. Mm -hmm. Zapiro has also faced a lot, of a lot of charges, a lot of problems due mm -hmm. to the criticism of the, his president. Mm -hmm. And um, a cartoonist from Turkey, his name is Musakar. He works for a newspaper called Jamhuria there. Mm -hmm. So Musakar is still being detained, he's still in jail. Mm -hmm. He was arrested in the beginning of this month and he's still in jail. So a lot of cartoonists are there who mm -hmm. are facing many charges and many of them are still in jail. So mm -hmm. um, it does. It, you know, it, it kind of explains the power of cartooning because now they are attacking, attacking us. Mm -hmm. It means they are recognizing us yeah. as a bigger threat to their autocracy, to mm -hmm. their you know, abusive power. Sure. Only we should be responsible to decide our freedom. Not anybody else should decide that limit for us because all of us think in some other way and we will have to and we should have the right to express uh, our own thoughts. If someone else is deciding the limit, so the limit will be according to him. And who will be the person who will be deciding the limit? The man in power. And the power comes from the majority. So then the majority will dominate the world of the opinions, the world of the ideas. But it's still, I believe, and I strongly believe, and it's, it cannot be doubted that uh, we should have a kind of reasoning for what we say and what we should not say. Because we all always know what is good and what is bad. And this is a very basic kind of, you know, differentiation and basic kind of logic that we make since our childhood. We, we are raised in a way that, you know, that we can learn what is good and what is bad. And we should also, we should always, you know, follow that particular insti uh, intuition, I think. But uh, that was very interesting and enlightening. And uh, so uh, I'd like to give a round of applause. Uh, for <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thanks. Um,